Thank you so much, Brother Gary. Amen. Man, what a message. Good. What a message. I'm so glad you're here with us today. This is an article. I'm getting my specs on here. Out of a Daily Grit years and years ago. And here's what it says. In our let's make everything okay world, which is justification, what I'm preaching about today, you'll discover that in a minute. We often look at sin and wonder what's the big deal. After all, our sin isn't so bad. If we lie a little or cheat a little, what's the harm? If we gossip or use coarse language a few times, who's it going to hurt? What's so bad about sin? What's bad because of what it put Jesus through? Yes, our sin was the reason for the torment Jesus suffered as he made his way to the cross, hung on the cross, and ultimately died a horrific death. He said, of course, we can never undo what has been done, and that pain can never be reversed that we've caused. But yet, we must understand that if we continue to sin knowingly, we are in effect turning our back on Jesus Christ and his pain. It's as if we're saying that it doesn't matter to what we put Jesus through. We're going to do what we want. That's justification. The sin and the lie of the cross is to tell Jesus that even in his intense suffering, it's not taught us anything about the awfulness of sin. Father, we thank you for your word today. God, use it in such a special way and help these folks, God, respond the way that you want them to and help them to see that the altar is open, God, for prayer. The altar is open, God, for ministry. The altar, the altar is open, uh, God, for folks to make things right between themselves and you. And they can find forgiveness, help, mercy, healing for their families, healing for our nation. God, so we thank you. And God, if there be one here that's never accepted you as Lord and Savior, there's no greater need in this building. There's no greater need for those that are tuned in via Facebook today than to be saved. You said you must be born again or you cannot see the kingdom of God. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen. We'd ask you to first turn to the book of Genesis uh, chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And I hope and pray that you are very familiar with the passage where that the serpent, the Bible tells us in verse 1, is the most subtle beast of the field that tells us and as he, he begins to have and by the way the serpent is Satan uh, he began to have a discussion with the woman that God had given to Adam and <clears throat> here's the way it goes the serpent more subtly beast of the field which the Lord God had made he said to the woman yea had God said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden the woman said to the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden uh, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Uh, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, did eat, and gave also to her husband, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof that I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? The man said, and here comes justification. The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So justification has already started. You see, there's two kinds of justification. There's a kind that you and I have to justify our actions, and there's justification that God has. 
to make things right between ourselves and Him. I hope I don't have to tell you who's right. It's not us. Amen? It's God. And so what does is, what is the man, what does Adam do? So he blamed the woman, then he blames God that this is the woman that you picked out for me. That's a whole other sermon for some of you husbands. Amen? And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And what did the woman do? She does the same thing. She justified. The woman said she doesn't accept responsibility. She said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So there's some justification going on here, and it's been passed on through every generation since that time for us to justify our actions with ourselves and to our friends and with our friends. But it's not the same justification that God has when He makes everything in your life right. When you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, there's no other justification like that. As clean as you want to make yourself, as clean as you think you are, you're not as clean until God gets a hold of you. And He does the cleanup job in your life. And He touches you and He changes you. Then we move over to Jeremiah chapter 3. At the top of my Bible in this section, it is called Israel is Shameless. Israel is shameless. I said Jeremiah chapter 3, and I'm looking at Isaiah. So that's a problem between me and my word here. I've got it straight now. Jeremiah chapter 3, we pick it up at verse 6. Remember, the heading of this is Israel is shameless. Now let me just take you, those of you that keep up with, with the media, keep up with things that are going on. Uh, every day I look at West Kentucky Star to see how many of the members of Vanzor Baptist Church have been arrested. Not really. Amen? But I do look at it every day. And I get, I, I get amazed at the look of some of the people's faces that have just been arrested for either drug possession or either some kind of other crime. And, and they look so happy. They're smiling. And, and they're sitting there. They're, they're down to nothing. But they're, 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 they don't have a shirt on. they got nothing. And Brother Rodney is a corrections officer here. I get amazed. Brother Rodney, how they're just smiling. I, I can promise you when I ever get put behind bars, and I hadn't been yet, praise God, if I do, I ain't, I ain't possibly T, going to be happy about it, Cotton. Amen? Because I'm Amen. in trouble with the Lord, I'm in trouble with the law, and i got to come home to that wife sitting right over there. Amen? <laughs> but what's a, a, there, there, There's no shame anymore for sin. There's no shame for doing wrong. And Israel was the same way. And what they were doing, they were worshiping other gods. And let me tell you something. God takes that real personal. When you decide that I'm going to worship something or somebody else besides the one that sent His only begotten Son to die for you. It ought to make God so mad that He strikes us off the face of the earth, but He doesn't do it because of His grace. Amen? Yeah. And so we pick it up in verse 6. The Lord said unto me in the days of Josiah the king, this is Jeremiah speaking, have you seen that which backsliding Israel has done? She's gone upon every high mountain under every green peak not a tree, and there has played the harlot. So verse 6 is telling us that the nation of Israel, they don't have any shame. They're going to the top of a mountain to worship another God. At least sometimes, sometimes in our life, we feel like we're hiding when we do our sin. Amen? But they have no shame that they're worshiping other gods, and that's considered adultery with God. And he said, and I said, after she has done all these things, turn thou unto me. See, God always gives us an act. Amen? But she returned not. And her treacherous sister, Judah, saw it. And so verse 7 tells me and tells you that when we disobey God and we put other things before God that we think are more important, there's always somebody watching. There's always somebody noticing that, hey, he's not the real thing. He says he loves the Lord God more than anything, but yet where's he at today when it's time to worship Where's he at today when it's time to pray? Where's he at in his leadership with his family and devotion to God and the way that he behaves himself in the United States of America? Where in the world is he at with that? And I saw him of all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery. I had put her away, given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. It came to pass through the lightness of her heart. You're thinking, what does that mean? And maybe you already know. 
It means that she was looking at sin in a light way. It means you're looking at sin in, in, in a way that, you know, it, it's really no big deal uh, what I do. My sin's something personal, but we've already seen where Israel has already affected another nation, the southern kingdom of, of Israel itself. And so let me get back to my scripture here. And so here's what it said. And the Lord, well, let me, let me read verses, verse 9. It came to pass through the likeness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and stocks. That means that she worshipped man-made images made out of wood and stone. And the Lord said to me, The backsliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. There's that word justified coming in it today because that's what the message is about. And, and it says, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel. Say the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord. I will not keep anger forever. Forever. Israel justified herself. Hang on to that thought as I move again in another place in the scriptures. When we become justified, it means to cleanse ourselves. We justify ourselves. We're saying that I've I, I cleaned myself up. I've made myself in the clear. I've made myself righteous. I'm justified. What I wanted to do is it's self righteousness. Nobody in this building, and nobody on the sound of my voice and the sound of the Word of God, you cannot make yourself perfect. Amen. You cannot make yourself righteous. You can't do it through works. You can't do it through anything you do. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to clean you up to the point that you have the righteousness of God in you. Why is it that we feel like we can justify our actions? And maybe the answer will be a little bit further over in the Scriptures, how that we uh, see each other. So now turn to Luke chapter 18 in your Bible. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. It said, He spake this parable unto certain uh, which trusted in themselves. Now let me ask this congregation that are here today, how many of you all trust yourselves that you're not going to sin? No hands are going up. Amen? And if you're at home, if your hand goes up, you need to be saved. Amen? You can't trust yourself that you're not going to sin or do wrong. You can't do that. You've already proven that your whole life and I'm proving it in mine. And it said, two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican, which means he's a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now get, I want you to really get into this prayer right here as he's talking to God. Maybe you've said this before in a service. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Have you ever done that in a church service? Looked around and looked across the aisle and thought, I'm not as bad as him. I'm not as bad as her. I think that I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not like him. I'm pointing at Brother Jim here. You're innocent, Brother Jim. Amen. Uh, but I thank God that I'm not like you. Gary, I'm so thankful I'm not like you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're in the temple. They're in, they're in their version of church. And they, so he's, he got this thought against somebody else that's hurt. So, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like them. Isn't that what he's saying? Amen. Yeah. I'm not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. Now, <clears throat> chew on that just for a minute. Please. That's what he thinks of his prayer partner. They went in the temple to pray together, right? And now he's thinking, I, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like him. I don't want him praying for me, Brother Cotton. Amen? I, and then begin to brag on itself. See, so you can tell that he trusted in himself. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all I possess. The public is standing far off, and not even lift up so much of his eyes to heaven. And smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. 
God's justification, it sounds like this. Just as if I never sinned. When you justify yourself, you still are guilty of the sin of Jesus Christ. When Jesus justifies you, when His justification hits you, when He grabs a hold of you the day that you accept Him as your Lord and Savior. And that's what I pray for for my neighbor this morning. At 4.30, God stirred my heart and said, you need to go visit Him. And He rejected the gospel this morning. I'm very sad about that. Amen. Very sad about that. But I pray. I can't keep on praying. I can't not give up on God in His Amen. life. Right. But how sad when somebody rejects Jesus Christ. Right. It breaks your heart. Or it breaks mine. Right. Are you justified today through Christ? Or have you justified yourself? You see, we're in, one of the, we're in this time in our nation that whatever anybody wants to do, we justify and we decide, I'm okay, you're okay. Now let me put it on a level that maybe that everybody can understand. When I was young in school, myself and two accomplices that I had, uh, we had been spanked several times in school. I know that shocks you about your pastor. Uh, but we've been spanked several times. And so we got together and we got a plan that we're going to remove their ability to spank us. We're going to get their paddles and bury them. So on a Saturday, we snuck into the school. I hope everybody said somebody's not listening. We snuck into the school and got all the paddles from all the teachers that had whipped us. It's a pretty good stack of them, amen? We took them back behind the school and buried them in the ground. Why did we do that? She whipped me so I could justify hiding her paddle. She brought pain to me. He brought pain to me so I could justify hiding his paddle. I wanted that hole drilled in it so it really worked on your blessed assurance. Amen? Well, being dumb kids, the janitor watched us walk out there and bury all of them. So our rat janitor, amen, tell the principal, and then I found out of my two accomplices, one of them made a deal with the prosecutor principal, and he ratted on me and my other buddy. Amen? Let me tell you something, rats roaming rats, that's what you get. I can't tell you the result of it. I did not get a, a spanking because I deserved one from our principal. I didn't want one, Brother Jimmy, from him. Because he was about four foot, five inches tall and built like a stump. And uh, he, he was going to hurt me. Talk about some grace. But I was justifying what I did because they brought pain to me, even though I'd been disobedient. You see, that's self-justification. Because we're all sinful. When we justify ourselves, we're still not clean. Because you see what I did through my justification? I went and committed another crime. Maybe some people in the streets need to hear that message today. Amen? You can't do it that way. God won't honor it that way. So justification happens that way. And look how that I included other people and we included each other. Because you see, here's what I can do. And if I'm in cahoots good enough with my good old friend over here, Jimmy Duncan, if I can be explaining to him what all's happened to me and I want to get somebody back, maybe I can get Jimmy to say, yeah, you know what? Uh, you've, got a, you've got a right to do that. You've got a right to get them back. You've got a right to punish him. You've got a right to seek vengeance. Let me tell you something. There's a big difference between right and reason. I may have a reason, but because I'm a creature of Jesus Christ, I have no right to do so. Amen. I have no right to do so. I can't justify that before God. And in this world of I'm okay, you're okay, it's easy to find a friend to justify you. Yeah, we're going to go out tonight, me and my buddy, we're going to party. Why? Because your wife mistreated you. We can justify going out drinking tonight and we'll, we'll drink our woes and troubles away. Why? Because look how she treated you. I'm going with you, man. Let's go, let's go drink a few together. That's self-justification. It's wrong. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, it says this. 
when we dare not make ourselves of the number, Paul's saying of other people, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves, comparing themselves among themselves, they're not wise. My comparison that I have to have and the comparison that you must have is with Jesus Christ and His actions. Because if you watch me long enough, if you say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do the rest of my life, I'm going to act like old brother Mike. Lord, you're going to be messed up. Because as soon as you see me fail, as soon as you see me fall, then you're saying, what am I basing my justification on? <coughs> it's not on us. It has to be God. He said, when you commend yourself to others and they commend themselves to you, you're just you're basing your actions on other people. That's not what God wants. Verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 10 says, that he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Verse 18, for not he that commends himself is approved. I'd like to be approved of God. How's that done? But when the, when the Lord commends when you ask God to forgive you and make things right in your life, ask Him in your heart to save you and do your best to live for Him, use Him as your measuring stick. Use the actions of Jesus Christ what you measure your actions by. Because everybody else, as much as you love them, as much as you care for them, as much as you trust them, they will fail you. Then where do you go with your actions then? Because you've set a standard against another human being. We're supposed to be. The Word of God says, He said, Be you holy for I'm holy. What a challenge to be holy. Amen? Amen. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 26, oh. it says this, and I know you've heard this many times, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Brother Mike, I really don't need you to tell me that. Romans 3, 23, brethren. For all have come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. I was told this morning, I don't want to hear preaching. So I'm not talking to you about preaching. I'm talking to you about what the Word of God says. That you need to be saved. You need to be born again. Amen. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified, there's that word again, freely, by His grace. You were justified when you got saved. It cost you nothing. Right. It cost Him everything Amen. on the cross. Right. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word redemption there means your ransom was paid in full because somebody else by the name of Satan himself, he had your life in control. He had you in prison by sin and you probably did not even know it. Your ransom has been paid. He, had, he kidnapped you. He had to let you go because of what Christ did on the cross. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, which means an atoning victim. Christ was a victim through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness by the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. That means God showed some self-restraint. The next time you see someone hurting your child, let me know how you feel about that. Let me know how you feel about that. I guarantee you, you'll, you'll raise up some anger that you've not seen in a long time. If somebody's hurting your child, and they're torturing and crucifying the Son of God. Do you think that God did not have to show some self-restraint that by just one word out of His mouth He could kill everybody on that hillside? But He had self-restraint because Christ had to die on the cross. And He had to pay for our sin debt. Our sin debt. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that it might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. What is that talking about? That means that we are able to connect up with Jesus Christ because God the Father needed a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus not only was faithful all the way in his life, 
But every step on the way to the cross, while he was on the cross, he still never committed sin. So therefore, his justification was pure and perfect, so he could be risen again. And so we hang on to that. Thank God for a risen Savior that we worship today. Amen? So that perfect sacrifice had to be Jesus Christ. Romans 4.25 said this, He was delivered for our offenses, raised again, or here's that word again, raised again for our justification. Therefore, Romans 5.1, be justified how? By faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now it struck me as I was prepared for today's message, and I'm about done. It struck me as I read the passage about 5,000 men, not including the women and the children, and Matthew chapter 14, verse 21. From five loaves and two fishes, there were 5,000 men that were fed. And the next passage in Matthew 15, verse 34, from seven loaves and two fishes, there's another 4,000 men besides the children and the women that Jesus Christ fed. The Bible says in Matthew 14, 30, that the lame, the blind, the dumb, the maimed, there were great multitudes, and he healed them. I can't read one place in the Scripture. I can't read one place in the Scripture for anybody. So there's 9,000 men there, not including the children and the women. So it would be safe to say 12, 13,000 people that Jesus Christ changed their life. Not one gave one second of protest about an innocent man being slaughtered on a cross. We ought to be the first ones, church, when we hear the song, stand up, stand up for Jesus, we ought to be on our feet. Amen. Protest Jesus Christ and how much He's done for us. Yeah. Amen. Uh, stand up for Him. Stand up for somebody that's never committed one sin but yet forgave you of all of yours. Then we can barely muster up enough strength to rise to our feet to worship Him. There's something not right. There's something not right. But boy, the crowd, the crowd muster plenty of people when they yell, crucify Him, crucify Him, His own people. The Bible says he came to his own and his own received him not. How long would it take him to be crucified today? He wouldn't set his foot on earth an hour. There'd be some crosses already erected waiting to hang him on and nail him on. Does anybody here see the spiritual condition that our nation is in? Yes. The absolute wrong that's going on that's called right. Yeah. And the right that goes on that's called wrong. Do you not think that Jesus Christ is not long for coming back to this world? Amen. But thank God this time, they can't lay their hands on Him. And we can't lay our, hand, our sinful hands on Him. He's going to come get us. Yeah. Yeah. His feet won't even touch the ground this first time. I'm excited about what God is going to do. But what is it? What is it about us? What is it about our Christian nation that we're not standing? We sit back and we don't let our voice be heard over a Savior that never committed a crime and paid for hours. If you're in the midst of self-justification, let me read this scripture as we close. They'll sing a hymn of invitation in just a minute. Romans chapter 14, verse 11 and 12. The Bible says, For it is written, For it says, As I live, say it is written. Let's see it. For it, as it is written, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, 
Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess so that every one of us shall give account of our neighbor's actions. Huh? We got to give account of ourselves. Are you self-justified today? If you are, then you're wrong. And you're on your way to a devil's hell. You've got to be justified, which means made right, cleaned up, made righteous, be whole, be at peace through Jesus Christ. Amen. If you need Christ, you come today. Maybe there's folks that have justified their actions around you that caused a lot of pain in your life. Maybe you need to come pray for them and pray for yourself that God would help you handle it in the right way. Because we all find reasons. We all find reasons because we're hurt all the time. We find reasons to not forgive anybody. But we don't have a right not to forgive. I don't know what your deeds are today. But maybe there's some folks who just need to come pray and feel welcome to come to this altar. I promise you God will meet you here. Everybody has been too busy in our nation saying, I'm okay, you're okay. Sin's never okay when you look at the cross. You come if you have a need today. Go ahead, Brother Jimmy.